number 226 is a very good invitation song for the lesson this evening. We're going to be looking at Psalm 79, picking out some points in here and uh, talking about uh, sin and its con consequences, or really the suffering, uh, suffering the consequences of sin. And this is a very challenging psalm uh, because it takes Israel into that period of time when the destruction of Jerusalem comes upon them. Uh, probably a lamentation over the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. It speaks of the physical carnage that was left after the Babylonian armies under Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem for the third and final time in 586 B.C. And you can correlate this a little bit to the book of Lamentations written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the prophets that spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem, but uh, Jeremiah was able to walk through some of the earlier destructions and just weep over what had happened. Uh, the destruction, not only of that beautiful city, but the beautiful temple. But what this really does, this, this psalm kind of takes a look at the reasons why Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Uh, the Gentiles, or heathens, defiled the most holy place of the Jewish religion. Same thing happens in AD 70 when the Romans come in. But they defiled it from the outside. And what Hosea, another prophet, prophesying about that period of time says is that uh, the Israelites had, had defiled it on the inside. And that's why God allowed the Babylonians to destroy it from the outside. So the psalmist's heart is torn open by this great tragedy. And, and you know, when somebody opens their heart in a psalm like this, you know, Oh, what do they want? You know, they just don't want us to necessarily just hear it and say, oh, well, you know, that's so bad. Uh, the psalmist wants us to look into that broken heart. Look into it and see the sorrow that is there, the, the, the terrible agony that the soul goes through because something as terrible as this happens. Now, uh, you think back a few years ago, uh, September the 11th, 2001, you know, our hearts were in our throats when we saw that destruction and what was going on. And we worried about, well, what's going to come next? What's going to happen next? Is, is our way of life over? And you think of all the things that we thought about at that time, reliving, it seems, those possibilities again now, but for them it was a reality. Their world was changed forever with the destruction of Jerusalem. So we need to examine his heart, but also examine our heart and the things that we go through. Uh, analyze those hearts, for there's no place on earth that is more sacred and in need of cleansing than our own hearts. The Bible constantly talks about that that we need to examine and cleanse, purify the heart so that we can stand in a right relationship with God. Out of the heart flows the issues of life or the springs of life. You know, uh, talking about creeks there a little bit ago, and see the creek didn't get so high that Jack couldn't get to the services tonight. But those creeks typically start from springs somewhere. And that's what that part that you know in the Psalms where it talks about the issues of life. It's the springs of life, the sources of life. This is where it comes from. And it begins in the heart. The, the heart directs our lives because, yeah, we want to be rational human beings, don't we? We want to have a reason for everything that we do. But when it comes down to it, if we don't have an emotional attachment to the things that we're doing, we're not going to do them with all of our heart. What did Jesus say? The two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second one is likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That cannot just be in a rational state. Though a God they love is doing good to your neighbor, still, if there's not that emotional component there, 
then how much are we really going to love our neighbors? Well, the same thing comes down through in this. If our hearts are filled with sin and uncleanness, it won't be very long before our whole bodies are defiled. So with the children of Israel, as the temple became defiled, all of Israel becomes defiled. Because God was looking at their reaction to Him, their response to Him in their worship and service. So uh, we have to keep the inside cleansed, keep it from defilement, so that we don't have to face the consequences of sin like the children of Israel had to do physically back in their time. So if we as the Lord's church become defiled, then, and this is verse 4 of that Psalm 79, we will have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those who are around us. So the psalmist asks a very important question. How long do we have to suffer the consequence of sin? Verse 5. How long, Lord? How long do we have to put up with this? How long do we have to go through this? Well, the Lord's going to put people through whatever they need to go through until they're purified. He's like the, the, uh, the potter who takes that, oh, I'm sorry, like the silver smith takes that piece of silver and puts it in the fire. And he's going to keep it in there until it's pure. Not any longer because it'll damage it and ruin it. But he's going to keep it in there as long as he needs to to get it to come out right. And that's the way God works with us. See, it almost sounds as if the psalmist is blaming God for the nation's destruction. They're suffering. God, it's your fault that, that, that this was all destroyed. You didn't protect us. And, you know, sin does incur the wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. God was jealous for Israel and Jerusalem, but He was jealous of them, or for them, for this reason. He had cleansed them. He, he had brought them out of Egyptian bondage. He had taken them out of the wilderness. He cleansed them. He, he set them up. Put them in Jerusalem. Put them at the temple. And what did they do? You look at the book of Ezekiel. They're worshiping idols in the temple. They turn their back to the temple and they worship the sun rising in the east in the morning. Is there any reason or any wonder that God destroyed them? How do you think of God patiently waiting and sending the prophets to them over and over again? Hey, repent, repent, get back to the old ways. Jeremiah said, ask for the old paths, but, but they just wouldn't do it. And you kind of think about God and, and what He was feeling. You know, there's a guy one time that had a car that uh, he had used up about half of it, okay? It was a used car, but, but he didn't have any more use for it, so he decided that he would give that car to somebody who really needed a car. And it was, I mean, he took good care of it. He kept it waxed up and shined, and he took maintenance-wise care of it. It had new tires on it, a new battery, new windshield wipers. And he just didn't give away a piece of junk. He gave away a very good automobile that would last someone for a very long time to get some use out of it. But within about a month, he saw that guy driving the car, and it was a mess. It was beat up. It was dirty. It was rattling. And the guy wondered, what, what, what good did I do giving that car <coughs> to that person? I'll never give another vehicle to anybody else, the man said. You see, when we're giving, given something, sometimes we just don't appreciate it so much as when we work for it. But see, we can't work for our salvation. God gives it to us as a gift. Now, there are conditions that we must meet having received that. And it's just like that car. You get that car as a gift, but God then expects you to maintain your salvation. Our salvation. We've got to keep it up. So how does God feel when we let the very heart of us get defiled with sin? 
and we don't maintain the purity of our hearts. The psalmist says in verses 6 and 7, this is kind of a compiling of it. Look what those evil people have done to your temple, God. Look at what those Babylonians have done to your temple. They've, they've, they've just made it a mess. And it's human nature that being caught in sin, we look for a worse evil to blame than, than ourselves. The, only, the Babylonians only did on the outside what the Israelites had already done on the inside. And again, that's what the prophet Hosea says. So God would punish the Babylonians for what they did, even though God sent the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem and the temple because Israel, the Judeans, they, they wouldn't repent. Even though he sent them, God says, I'm going to punish them. I'm going to punish them because, you know, they're, they're no better off than you are. They're, they're, they're not a better people than you are, Israel. You both sin. Now, now you kind of get the understanding of what Paul talks about. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all sin and come short of the glory of God. But sometimes God will use the people more evil than we are to punish us for the sins that we're not taking care of in our lives. So he punished them, but God allowed them to destroy the city, but they didn't have to do it. They could have been merciful, but God knew that they wouldn't be. That they, the type of people the Babylonians were, they would destroy everything. So Judea was punished appropriately for breaking God's covenant. You know, in the wilderness wanderings, it took a generation. When the children of Israel came out, and then uh, when God was taking them to the promised land, got to Kadesh Barnea and says, okay, go get the land. They sent in the twelve spies. And the twelve spies came back in Israel. Oh no, we can't do it. We're not strong enough. And you know something? They were right. They weren't strong enough. They weren't powerful enough to go in and take the promised land. God was going to give it to them. But they refused. So God turned them back out into the wilderness. And 40 years they wandered while that generation died. And then the next generation went in. But see, when the, when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, it was 70 years before they came back. 70 years before they came back because God was taking all those years of jubilees and Sabbath years that they had not served Him as they should have. God got back a 70-year rest on His land. It grew up with some thorns and thistles and some wild animals. So when they came back, they had to deal with that and they had to deal with the Samaritans that were in there. But yet God says, you didn't work for it. I gave it to you. You didn't appreciate it. You know what's going to happen? Next, you're really going to have to go through some struggles to get it back and to get it right. And it took them another, you go down to about 400. <laughs> so you're, you're talking about another 130 years till the coming of the Grecian Empire where they at least get some semblance of the freedom that they had had from their enemies and from in the past. The psalmist says in verses 8 and 9, again this is a compilation, God forgive us of our sins for your name's sake. For your name's sake, God. Just because you're God and you chose us to be your chosen people, forgive us of our sins, even though we're going to keep on doing the sins. And God does not forgive sins without repentance. So either we will humble ourselves before God to have our sins forgiven, or God will humble us before Himself. Pride and the arrogance of the children of Israel believing that they were God's chosen people because they were good, 
Not because of the faith of Abraham and not because of the faith that they were supposed to have. But we're just God's chosen people because that's who we are. Uh, that attitude would never allow them to seek repentance and forgiveness of sins from God. They thought they could do anything that they wanted to and because they were God's chosen people, God would just go ahead and keep on blessing them, keep them going. Jerusalem was God's city. And the temple was God's dwelling place. God took away that physical link between Himself and Judah when the Judeans broke the spiritual link. That's the key. God took away the physical link, the city and the temple. When Judah broke the spiritual link, that was to worship God in spirit and truth, to have faith and to trust in God and to obey His commandments. When they stopped that, God, God took away the physical from them. They broke the covenant God had made with them through Moses. And their breaking of the covenant then relinquished the promises that God had made to them and made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob about how he would care for his people. They broke the spiritual link. Uh, there is a basic question to be contemplated here. Does God owe us forgiveness or do we owe God repentance? We know that God doesn't owe us forgiveness, but we do owe God repentance. We owe it to Him to turn and go back to Him, to change our mind about you know, the, this world that we live in, that there's, there's really something uh, uh, profitable here in the world. What did Jesus say? What shall a man be profited if, she, if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Uh, so we've got to change our minds to understand that spiritual link is so important to us if God is to bless us. There's an old saying that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, twice Jesus states that unless we repent, we will perish. So we are in constant need of repentance because we're in constant need of turning back to God. It's just the, the way that we live. It's, it's the world we live in. We've got to be constantly asking for that forgiveness and seeking His support. Do you suppose the Judeans were any worse sinners than we are? Now you think about it. And that's a play on Luke chapter 13. Because the people were talking about the, the Judeans who were killed uh, at the festival by Herod for whatever reason. Jesus said, do you suppose they were worse sinners than you and the the people who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them. Jesus, do you suppose that they were worse sinners than you? But he constantly comes back to that. I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. So there's this always looking, there's always this desire, this is there's always this growing closer to God. And it, be, and it always comes down to that repentance, the changing of the mind and the changing of the direction that we go into. Now the psalmist says, again, verse 10 through 12, again, a compilation, God, it's no fun being persecuted. I wonder how long it took them to figure that out. In fact, the New Testament tells us it's not a joy when we suffer. I think Peter talks about it. So when we suffer, we better make sure that we're suffering for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. It's no fun to be persecuted. Well, we got an old saying, don't we? If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. <laughs> now in the sense... We'll be persecuted for wrongdoing, even though we repent. 
we'll be persecuted for doing what's right. So which is more profitable to us? Be persecuted? We're going to be persecuted no matter what. The benefit is pers being persecuted for doing what is right. What we should be doing. Having that right relationship with God. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And that's that concept of being persecuted for doing what is right. Jesus said when they, they uh, say bad things about you and treat you badly, harshly, and, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, then that, that's when you're blessed. That's when we're blessed. So persecution for doing what is right it's not a bad thing. See, they had them a little bit confused. They thought they were being persecuted, and they weren't. They were being punished. God was punishing them for breaking that spiritual link. It was never God's intention that His name was to be made known to the Gentiles through His punishment of the Gentiles. So what? It was never God's intention that His name was to be made known to the Gentiles through punishing the Gentiles. In other words, that Israel would take up arms and go out and just defeat their enemies. Now, we understand that Israel had to go to war and most of the time it was to defend themselves. And lots of times when Israel went out to war because it was Israel's intent to do the war, they were defeated. When the enemy was attacking, God was with them as long as they were right with God. But Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles, calling them to God's righteousness. They were supposed to say, look what a wonderful land this is, a land flowing with milk and honey. This came to us. This was given to us because our fathers made a commitment to God, and God blessed them. And we're here, and we're living in this paradise on earth, and we are offering to share with you the secret so that you can also live a, 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 a blessed, fulfilling, prosperous life. But Israel didn't do that. Israel sealed the, the doors and said, the Gentiles are no good. Again, we're God's chosen people and we don't need to take the light to them. So their sin had darkened their light and hid God's face from them. Not from the Gentiles. There are many Gentiles that we see mentioned in the Old Testament who when it comes right down to it, had more faith than most of the Israelites. Rahab and Jericho had more faith than the previous generation of Israelites did. Ruth, later on, what faith she had. Naomi, oh, call me Naomi. Uh, yeah, what? I'm going to get back to the names and make sure. Anyway, her name was meant pleasant, but she says, don't call me that anymore. Call me depressed, frustrated, you know, tired of all of this mess, see. Uh, but Ruth, Ruth says, I'm going with you. I'm going to take care of you because I've learned to trust your God. She was from Moab. She grew up worshiping idols. And like the Thessalonians we studied about on Wednesday night here in the recent past, they turned from dead idols to serve the living God. And you think about Naaman, the leper, and the faith and trust that finally developed in him. And the commitment, I will not worship. If I have to go in to the idol temple as bodyguard to my king. Understand, I do that 
just on that, I'm not going in there to worship. Give me some dirt to take home so I can worship the God of Israel. Of course, he's the God of heaven, and he can be worshipped anywhere. But that was his understanding of things. But Israel refused to do it. So the consequences of sin would be a burden to the people of Judah for those 70 years as God purged away their sin in the land of idols and gross immorality. Think how terrible it was for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go and to serve in the capacity that they served the Babylonians and the Assyrians and even down into the Medo-Persian Empire. Knowing that just a few hundred miles to the west was the promised land, the land of ruins. That was the lesson that Israel learned. And when they made their journey back, they were changed. Not all of them, but many of them were more dedicated to God and saying, idolatry no more. And Israel after that point did not have a problem with idolatry. They had a lot of other problems, but it wasn't with idols. Not even at the time when Jesus walked upon the earth. We, in a similar way, must work to eliminate the defilement of sin in ourselves and in the church. Only then can we show forth the praises of God in an acceptable manner and be a light for the next generation of Christians who are coming along. The lesson is yours. Thank you for your time. If you have need, please come. Take a seat up here in the front. So we stand and sing the invitation song.